demonstrative purposes to, to show you. We really put together stuff uh, well um, and nice, good packets, and Chuck showed the video. And it was, it was an excellent presentation, okay? To this day, I don't know of any coverage that it got. There were people there. Uh, and the one reporter that I thought of from Philadelphia Daily News, Vicki Wiseman, says, written, she did write. And I'll get her article, Chuck. Um, I've not seen anything on it elsewhere. Uh, nowhere. Now, we did have competition that day, it's true. Uh, Boris Shelton, the Casper Weinberger indictment, the 20th anniversary of Watergate, uh, the good guys and the bad guys. It was having competition, to be serious. But, but, you know, this is Washington, D.C. On any given day, some important things are happening. There is no coverage at all. So the people who say, and this was a man who had been maligned, don't forget me, so I'm mouthing off on this frequently and ubiquitously. The Crenshaw had been uh, vilified, had been slandered, no question, called a liar expressly and implicitly. And he said he was there, he wasn't there, and so on and so forth. And now he's coming forward for the first time officially at a news conference to respond to that, and he doesn't get any coverage from the very newspapers and outfits that gave prominent coverage to Lundberg's presentation, which they knew or should have known consisted of many outright misrepresentations, such as I have already addressed and, and, and itemized for you, and Crenshaw now gets zero. So how anybody can be the least bit optimistic or the least bit pacifistic or anybody bending over backwards in the most uh, uh, New Testament Christian fashion and uh, wanting to say, hey, you know, the other side, they're, they're decent and they're fair and, and uh, so on. You know, you've got to be living in, in fantasy land. It's just not happening. The DC Bar program itself, by the way, which was an excellent program. I know Blakey, Liebler, uh, Barton, and me, and people who had, you know, been involved in this stuff heavy. And some of the HSCA attorneys, Andy Purdy, and uh, uh, Kevin Flanagan uh, are on my side, and, um, and a couple on the other side. This got only one, one article that I know of. One article, and not from the Washington Post. It was an AP release, and so I don't know where it was published. Uh, the Manquist had offered to send it to me, an AP release. I assumed that somewhere, maybe uh, Topeka, Kansas, or Waco, Waco, Texas, I don't know. But it sure did not make my New York Times or Washington Post. Um, and that was the DC Bar program. So, you know, you, you now get coverage. Bellin's next book, Blakey's next book, somebody else's next book, which supports the Whitefish Report, that will get coverage. Plausible denial will not get coverage. JFK Conspiracy Sounds will not get a book review. The New York Times Sunday book review. Bestseller list for about 10 weeks for Crenshaw's book. About 10, 12 weeks for Mark Lane's book. Mark Lane told me. When he came to Pittsburgh and I did a program with him promoting his book, um, Mark told me that uh, they called, you know, Nobody ever accused Mark Lane of being shy. Uh, Mark, Mark called at times and said, what about a book review on my book? You know, it's been on your bestseller list, hardback cover. And they, they said to him, well, there's nothing new. <laughs> um, that, that was their, uh, their response. Well, coming back to, um, to this business, here's another interesting thing I want to share with you that I'm doing some work on. You've seen it a thousand times, as I have the Zapruder film. Now, so you get shot in front or the back or whatever. So you got a wound in the neck. And uh, so you can see somebody my God, you know, shot like this, whatever. Think, we don't have that kind of a movement or something. What do we have? We have a bilaterally symmetrical upward flail, much higher than a you know, defensive posture or response to pain. And it's, it is, you know, like a, a coordinated, synchronized, bilaterally symmetrical movement. Discussed this with some medical people uh, and trying to do uh, some more work on this. There's a lot of things when you get into this stuff. There are such things as neurological reactions and responses, of course, when I, when I ridiculed before the phrase or a muscular reaction, this was not to suggest that there are no such things. 
decortical posturing, uh, which uh, physicians are all familiar with, uh, people that have massive infarcts in certain parts of the brain, and so on and so forth. And there are things that still have to be done. And there's work that several people are doing analytically. Let me also share, many of you have asked me about Tom Wilson's work, those of you who attended the Dallas program and who have heard about it. Tom um, is continuing uh, his work, and I have two uh, we've both been uh, busy, um, um, but what, what, where it stands now is we're having the process validated by uh, three or four or five or six, I don't know. I want to have at least three different people, whether it's MIT or Harvard or Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, at least three top people whose expertise cannot be challenged to validate the process. Not sure. 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 Well, would you explain what that process is? Because you're probably being very oh, oh, oh. Well, I'm sorry. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that's right. It is not the uh, same audience. Um, it's called um, image processing with computer analysis. That's what Tom calls it. Image processing with computer analysis. This is not enhancement. There is no subjectivity involved here. You don't deal with it and feed in what you want so that you can interpret what you hope for. You set it up and you feed in the pictures. You see, Tom, uh, retired chief electrical engineer, 30 years with U.S. Steel. It's a process he has been using as a consultant. Like, for example, let's say um, this uh, pointer flashlight comes off and uh, assembly line and there's some kind of defect. It's not turning properly. Uh, they're getting, the company's getting a lot of reports that it sticks or so on, and they, they feel that there's something, but they look and they analyze and they can't say anything. So Tom might go there and then go to the assembly line, and then with his pictures and with his process, he will be able to identify the defect that the human eye cannot see. The human eye can see about 30 shades of gray. His equipment can see 256 shades of gray. And as I mentioned in Dallas, I've seen the process at work in two cases in which I had Tom involved, a murder case in Hawaii, um, studying a home in the film of a young child that was considered to have been um, beaten by his stepfather and then killed, and then a product liability case, a multi-million dollar action in uh, Michigan State involving one of the major car manufacturers and the question of a head wound and somebody who had not been autopsy and uh, the question of whether the body should be dug up or not plaintiff's attorney had to know whether he wanted to get into that. And uh, so there was a photograph taken by the state policeman, and based upon Tom's analysis, decided that it would be worthwhile to sustain his theory. The body was dug up, I did the exhumation autopsy, and all the injuries were there. But Tom's not a doctor, so he didn't say uh, this kind of fracture, that kind of hemorrhage, but he said there is uh, definite disruption, there are definite lines of, of break fracture, and so on, and indeed, they were all there. So I've seen the work. And then another thing, which are non medically related, we had a motor regatta accident uh, that nobody could figure out, and Tom analyzed it. There was a statue of Jesus in a church in Ambridge, a suburb of Pittsburgh. They got national attention, and people insisted that the statue would, was, was weeping at different times, and Tom's analysis had demonstrated and explained that um, pseudo phenomenon. So anyway, that work, that work is going on. And you know, there are many different ways in which uh, this business may yet be, uh, be open. Let me, um, let me at this point, I just have three or four slides which you have seen before and which will be largely redundant following Bob Broden's excellent detailed analysis. But I just want to, uh, at the risk of, of boring some of you, um, who have, who have heard this before, I just want to zero in very quickly on the magic bullet in terms of um, the three specific medical, forensic, scientific, criminalistic reasons why it is a sham. In addition to what you can see on the Sapruder film, what John Conley has always said from the first news conference while he was still a patient at Parkland Hospital, let's see specifically the weight and the trajectory and the condition. Can I have those uh, few slides, uh, please? This will just take a couple of minutes. Uh, this is a, a key frame that, that you've seen, Bob, so yesterday, uh, 230. Um, and 
And, and you see that uh, Kevin has been shot. Uh, you see the arm, by the way, in the upward posture. And look at Conley now. And just keep in mind the 1.6 seconds approximately have gone by. He's been shot through the chest, through the wrist, and into the thigh. Look at the location of the wrist. You can see the fingers. You can see the hat being held. And just picture that this man now, by definition, with a missile traveling 2,000 feet per second from muzzle, blast, slow down, um, if you went, if you go with the single body theory, slow down uh, 150, 200 feet, maybe going through Kennedy's neck, uh, but still moving then 1,900 feet, 1,800 feet per second. So in, for all intents and purposes then, even though these frames are only 1 18th of a second, that bullet has ripped through it. He's got seven wounds, um, Bob, it's four inches of the bone, 10 centimeters. Um, I want to, you, you said three, so it's even better than you think. <laughs> uh, fifth rib anteriorly have been shattered, and a comminuted fracture, Bob said that a big fracture is right, comminuted means fragmented, and the distal end of the radius has been comminuted, and the radial nerve, which plays a role in permitting the clutching of objects, apposition of thumb to fingers and so on, has been severed, and there he sits. So that's, you know, that's a key frame to, to keep in mind and to dwell on. Next, please. This is a picture of one fragment. You've heard uh, from Bob and Dr. Crenshaw and others, and you've read and, and so on. There's just no question. Some people say four to six fragments. I think uh, Chuck told me yesterday as many as eight fragments. Uh, Audrey Bell has testified to this. What difference does it make? Four, six, eight? Mm. The piece in Conley's thigh that remains and so on. Is there a way that a bullet would have lost only one and a half percent of its total weight from 161 grains to 158.6 grains? There's no way. It's impossible. That alone, that all by itself throws out the single bullet theory. Just think about that. That simple, simple thing. Next one. The trajectory, the different sketches. Bob showed the sketches. This sketch, I don't know who gave it to me, where it came from. Um, move it over. I don't care. They talk about, well, gee, maybe it would have caught Conley. The left shoulder, you don't have to deal with that. I just want to emphasize a couple of points for you. Don't get into that kind of an argument. It hit him behind the right posterior axillary area. That's behind the right armpit. That's where it is. I mentioned before about moving Conley over and over and over. There are two jump seats in that car, not three, there are two. There was no third person there. It was Conley and his wife. I said to them at DC bar 10 days ago, you know, with all due respect to, to, the, to the magnificent work that, that the Stone people did in the movie, and, and all the work that everybody does with fancy lasers, I told about it. I said, you know, forget the lasers and forget all of these wonderful things. How's about just going out and buying 300 feet of, of clothesline and so on, get them to just stop the traffic on Dealey Plaza, set the goddamn car down, take the clothesline. This is the way they do it. My friend Herb McDonald, um, this is what Herb did here in Chicago with the Black Panther shootout that he and I were involved in many, many years ago. Only did it with rods, dowels, uh, to show that 100 shots came in to Fred Hampton, not one went out. It was, it was murder. It was, it was, a, it was a, a planned murder. Uh, but that's the way you do it. And we do it many times. So you take the car, oh, show me all these lasers and all these pictures and sketches and diagrams, and, and this is the way you think it was, and this is the way you told this artist to draw it. Just put two people in the car, take the clothesline, run it, pull it taut and stretch, and have the clothesline come in to the one person's back, and then have it continue at the angle that we have it coming out of the neck. If you can get that clothesline to Conley's right posterior axillary area, I'll buy you every clothesline that exists in America. I mean, there's just no way in the world. There's no way. Move the line over. Catch his shoulder. Catch his middle of his back. I don't care what you catch. How do you come to the right armpit area? And then how do you get to the wrist? You saw on 230 that the wrist is here. Did he have the wrist down? Oh, by the way, this is what they'll do. At the DC bar, somebody said his legs were crossed. That just went out like that. I said, really? 
you know, I've heard guys present a thousand times. I've never heard that Conley's leg. That's a new one, you see. Now they'll have his legs crossed. That's very interesting. They're not dumb. So what? That brings the leg over now, right? And then the hand was here. I, they, they, they have some problems. By the way, an additional problem they have on trajectory is now related to the question of whether the transverse process of the second thoracic vertebra was broken. You know, that was never mentioned, was never found, never referred to by the Wired Commission nor by the Rangers Clark Panel in 68. And by the way, Bob, one other thing, um, the Ramsey Clark Panel, they're the ones who first moved the hole up 100 centimeters, 100 millimeters, uh, 10 centimeters, 4 inches. It wasn't the French pathology panel. The French pathology panel went along with that, this so-called shaving of a piece of metal, which they claim demonstrates the point of entrance of the colic area. But the Ramsey Clark panel, Fisher, uh, Moritz, uh, Carnes, and uh, whatever so, um, um, and the radiologists know sometimes how to work. Anyway, but they're the ones that first uh, come up with that. The, uh, the, 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 if the bullet was deflected by bone, so they might like that to explain the upward angle of 11 degrees. Michael had a tough time, Michael Bott in DC, talking about, so how do they explain the forensic pathology panel's conclusion that the bullet through Kennedy had an upward angle of 11 degrees? They said, well, Kennedy, if you, if you put his head down a little bit, then would go back to the Zapruder film. Well, what is there is there. Were they going through the motorcade like this? <laughs> Don't look at me. Look at the film. Look at the slides. They're what they're doing what politicians do. What they're supposed to do. It's not what we think. And then they'll give you that, that junk about well, what happens behind the stem of freeway side. Nine tenths of a second. You tell me what happened. You ask O.J. Simpson in his, at the peak of his career what he did in nine tenths of a second, and that was with a planned faint and a move. Nine tenths of a second, yeah. They said shift height, Kennedy moved to the right, Kennedy moved to the left, they got back in the position and they came out from the side. <laughs> you know, that, that's behind the stem of the freeway side, yeah. Like they went away, uh, they went away and had a huddle and came back. <laughs> you know, this kind of nonsense, uh, you know, there's certain things, I, I just, I just, I won't even, you know, I won't even tolerate hearing it. And people uh, talk about John Latimer. John Latimer could not qualify to testify in a murder case of Mary Smith or Tom Jones in, uh, in, in, in East Ogishu, uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. I mean, I mean, he could not. Well, gee, he says he saw gunshot wounds in the arm. I'd like to see those cases documented. If he saw them, he saw them maybe as a doctor operating on them, not as any kind of a forensic scientist. And he says, well, uh, I had a relationship with a medical examiner. One time he walked through and shook hands with Milton Helper. Or saw him from the and that made him a forensic pathologist. And people, people, critics, critics, talking about John Latimer? You want to talk to me about Michael Biden? You want to talk to me about the forensic pathologist? You want to talk to me about Vincent Gwynn? I got to deal with the NAA stuff. There's a PhD and so on. Yeah, I got stuff to deal with. I can't be cocky, arrogant, or disdainful of that. I got to deal with that as a forensic scientist. Don't talk to me about a piss specialist, John John Lambert, who hasn't looked above the level of the umbilicus in 40 years. <laughs> I called up and spoke with the president of the AMA years ago. He was from Erie. His name was Roth, a urologist. That's why I called him. He's a Pennsylvania and a urologist. And I called him up, and this was way back. And I just asked him to tell me a little bit about um, about um, Vladimir. And he laughed. It wasn't an unfriendly uh, laugh. And I said, what are, you, what, are you, what are you laughing about? He says, well, he says, John Vladimir is an expert on anything he wants to be an expert on. Whatever, he picks the area, and he makes himself into an overnight expert. And there are people out there, the critics come to me and say, hey, what about John Vladimir? Don't, don't, don't talk to me. You want to talk to others, talk to others about John Latimer. Huh? Because in, in a routine murder case in Chicago or Pittsburgh, John Latimer would not be qualified, would not be permitted to testify as an expert on gunshot wounds. Bet me, bet your house on that. Okay? So don't talk to me about John Latimer. Uh, oh, who was it? It was Jerry. Uh, Jerry pointed out, remind me, I said, John Latimer said when he was asked about the gunshot wound to the neck one time, um, um, Jerry says that his answer was that you know that it could not have been entrance because he said in order for it to have been an entrance wound, somebody would have had to have been shooting from the floor of the car it had that kind of an angle. <laughs> kind of an angle, okay? Well, let's take it in reverse then. Let's have it being shot from the back. 
and it has that kind of an angle. All right, anyways, trajectory. And then next, please, the condition. There's the bullet, as Bob uh, told you or somebody else. So that's the spectrographic analysis um, test that was done where you see the little acneiform lesions up at the tip. Next, please. Here's the nose to come. Look, look, this is the bullet. Broke two bones, mm, the right fifth rib, and the distal end of the radius. Look at it. Totally intact. Completely undefaced, undeformed. Next, only the base has the slight um, protrusion, extrusion of lead. Next, please. And then the slide that I, I think is my number one. If I had to just, if I could just take one slide with me to Valhalla, I want to take this slide. Uh, <laughs> this was their Edward Army Arsenal experiment. There's our hero at the end, at far left, and then two bullets shot in the cotton wadding. Look at the base of those bullets, and you see they have <laughs> the same protrusion, even more arguably than the stretcher bullet. And then the next bullet, the second one from the right, it looks like different ammunition, doesn't it? But it's not. It just broke a rib of a goat and got somewhat flattened um, and seemingly elong elongated. And then finally, the bullet that broke a radius of the human cadaver at the far right. Keep in mind, I did not select the representative bullets. This is the government's picture, not mine. I wasn't there. I wasn't selecting then the bullets with the worst deformity to prove my case. They were selecting the bullets with the least deformity to prove their case. They won't repeat this experiment. Bob told you yesterday about he wanted to uh, uh, bring up some doctors uh, and uh, Blakey's excuses. You know what Blakey first said? Blakey said to me, uh, to the third reason well, we can't do it, it's too expensive. I offered to pay for it then. I said, well, fine, I'll, I'll pay for it. What's the, what's the problem here? Uh, we get a gun and bullets and some cadavers uh, and so on. So uh, we'll let me get off the expense thing.
Dr. Crenshaw, what was the apparent condition of John F. Kennedy top of the head the last time you saw it? Top of the head. There was no damage from the face, top, what we call the frontal part of the head. So that where I'm placing my hands right now, you would say essentially there was no damage. And frontal and parietal, there was no damage there. But in the occipital, occipital parietal area where I have my hand now, there was. The size of a baseball, about two and three fourths. Bump on the back of your head, right between the ear and there. There is a blood of the defect. Thank you. Was there an apparent wound observed by anyone to the back of the president at Parkland? The back that is so called entrance wound? No, the back that the no, back. We did not turn him over and even lifted him into the car. Is it true that Dr. Carico ran both hands? Underneath his back, checking for a wound. Do you know that? that? I do not know. And were there two nurses who washed in front of that? Pardon? Were there two nurses who washed in front of the back? I don't think the back brace was even removed. No, the back brace was initially, later on. Right. Good, thank you very much. I am going to start up this way, around and around. First question. Let me ask a question to both of you. Uh, these are my wife's questions. Um, she uh, liked your book a great deal, Dr. Crenshaw. Her question was about the closing of the eyes. Uh, in your book, you state that you uh, close the eyes. In the autopsy pictures, we see open eyes. And if I may also ask Dr. Wecht, uh, could careless handling of the body have torn the neck wound open uh, and made a jagged? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not even Thank to be you. thought of or considered for one moment. On the eyes, I don't know uh, who closed them, but I do know they were closed uh, when we were pulling the sheet. And then when the uh, bags or the plastic sacks uh, uh, were placed over the head, I know that on the eyes were closed then. Therefore, they would have to have been manually opened again at the bed. Let me, Joy, let me, I, this is a point, it's a very important point I forgot to mention on this. Tom Wilson uh, has done work on these pictures. I got a hold of uh, several pictures from the foremost national um, cosmetology uh, group, commercial organization that uh, sells stuff to funeral directors and embalmers to prepare bodies for, uh, for viewing and for reconstruction, whether they be viewed or not. And, uh, I had heard about these pictures and so on, so I got in touch with them and uh, they sent them. They are pictures showing people, some of whom have had their faces disfigured by cancer, others by surgical procedures for cancer or other, others by trauma, some by gunshot wounds and so on. And they show what is done. These are then pictures that demonstrate what can be done, what materials are used, how much materials were used because they show you know before and after. So in other words, you know exactly you've got controls. Using those controls, using those controls, which have nothing to do with JFK, there is absolutely no question that that picture, the death step picture, and others are fudged pictures. There is just no, no question that you are looking at heavy duty cosmetic uh, work there. So when you get in, you know, the picture that Dr. Crenshaw showed, the vacuum and everything's in place and so on, and the x-rays that Bob showed, which we talked about, etc. And that's why it's not easy to answer all the questions and have everything down pat, because once you get into a situation, the body's not available to you, and you have an inept, incomplete autopsy, very, very inadequate documentation and description, and then you've got photos and x-rays that have been altered, revised, and maybe some are total forgeries, you see, it's not easy to say, well, this is the way it was. Uh, it's, it's not so simple. It's the same, analogously, people say the bullets and, and so on. Oh, you know, when I sent them to the D.C. bar 10 days ago, he said, don't ask me about the bullets. I didn't have charge of that car. It wasn't my crime lab 
uh, they should have spent three, four days going over the car instead of getting an eye and already cleaning it, maybe as it sat outside park in the hospital. And what about the bullet that was found uh, out on the grassy area there, the deputy sheriff and the other guy picking up something? So don't, don't lay it on me. You tell me, you give me those answers, and then I'll put everything together. So we have burdens. And don't, don't permit somebody to put a burden on you that, that simply is not yours to shoulder. And that you intellectually, in all honesty, cannot really deal with because you don't have everything available to you. You don't even know that what you do have is the truth. Next question. Yes, uh, Dr. Prince, I have two questions. Um, first one is, was on the temporal side, the right side of the temporal side, was there a flap that was flapping over like it shows in the pictures you were showing? Did you was a flap of the skull that it shows on the side of like it's flapping over where the doctors was holding in the autopsy right here. Okay, here's the year going up. Right. right. So it had to have come right there out and not there. From the ear to the occiput, this was the big area of the baseball was out. And nothing on a temporal side. Or nothing on a temporal side. Right temporal. Oh, right. Okay. Here the second question I want to ask is then in your book, or in, in your book, you said that the president was praising his uh, casket and his clothes were neatly folded and put at his feet in the casket. You mentioned in your talk this morning that the clothes were given in the bag to the Secret Service agent. Could you please straight out? Now, initially, they were placed in the bottom of the coffin, but then a Secret Service man came, I'm not sure which one, and took those out and carried them with him. I guess, Dr. Crenshaw, do you have any thoughts on the why your colleagues from Berkman would now be changing their story? Thank you. No, I'm kind of worried about what their motives are now. I would assume that uh, quite a bit of the peer pressure uh, from uh, JAMA and are uh, trying to go along to get along. Uh, that's about the only thing I can really come up with. Uh, I don't, uh, we can talk about what slander is and malice and things like that. I'm not sure what those things are. Next question. Uh, I wanted to make a question to both of you. Uh, one is, I know it's incomplete autopsy, but uh, one thing that's disturbing is that uh, Hume's Boswell said that the two chest tubes were inserted, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, they said that they did not abridge the uh, prior pleura in the chest cavity. Uh, did you know any uh, uh, bubbles coming through the chest to the they were inserted to the, the tendons the chest during the time of the trauma run? This is for you, Dr. Fenton. Um, the chest tubes, all that I saw, you know, were put in by Baxter and uh, um, Peters on the right, uh, Jones and McClellan there. Now, both of these groups say that when the water, when they put the uh, tubing underneath the water seal drainage, there was bubbling. This would then be, you know, the idea of removing the air out of the thoracic cavity. And of course, obviously, to get rid of the pneumothorax and to stay in the lung. All I have is what they said that they do. I'm not sure I would even believe him or anything anymore. Well, that's my question. Uh, Dr. Weber, do you think it's possible that they did a thorough examination of the thoracic cavity oh. during the autopsy if they could not even tell what the chest tube had actually entered the uh, thoracic cavity? If they could not even tell what? Uh, according, I mean, Bob and Newton said that they thought the chest tubes were inserted to combat subcutaneous emphysema, which then makes no sense to me. Well, you know, keep, uh, keep in mind, of course, when they did the autopsy, they didn't know about the golden hole in front of the neck. And of course, we don't know how much reconstruction, um, how much uh, intellectual gymnastics went into it later on. Here's what they said. Uh, the third point of reference in connecting these two wounds back to, to neck um, is in the apex, parentheses, supraclavicular portion of the right portal cavity. In this region, there is contusion of the parietal pleura and of the extreme apical portion of the right upper lobe of the lung. In both instances, the diameter of contusion and ecchymosis at the point of maximum involvement measures five centimeters, both the visceral 
and pariopura are intact overlying these areas of trauma. So obviously you can't have a traversing missile if they are intact. Uh, the uh, conclusion um, that they describe, it's hard to know exactly what it is they're saying, it's possible that lines of force from a missile traversing the neck area, or missiles that we're dealing with, maybe two, one from the front and one from the back, could have produced some um, ecchymosis, you know, some slight extravasation from very tiny blood vessels in those areas. And that's what it seems like they're talking about. But there is no perforation, so there does not appear to be any entrance into the thoracic cavity by a bullet, just these two areas of, uh, of, of discoloration. Uh, well, I'd just like to say to the, the gentleman there they, they would have to have opened uh, the eyes at Bethesda to, ex to examine them as the condition of the eyes is reported in the autopsy report. And I'd like to say to Dr. Webb that I'm delighted what he just said about the undertakers because that uh, uh, fits in with the, uh, an article I just uh, recently sent into the third decade. And I would, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Webb, uh, does he know about uh, the, the findings that uh, Mr. Wilson uh, found in his work for Oliver Stone, that he said were uh, startling and dramatic, and that after the movie came out, even if, if it wasn't used in the movie, that it would be made public. And, and also, um, uh, uh, could you clear up the matter of the x-rays? I tried to bring this up in Dallas. Uh, the x-rays that we have seen are as published by the House uh, Select Committee, which are presented in cropped fashion to show the extent of the wounds while still maintaining a sense of propriety, as they say. But the ones your panel saw, uh, there was a face, wasn't there? There was a forehead, there was an orbit. And... Well, the pictures that we saw are the pictures that Dr. Crenshaw is shown here, uh, plus others, right, Bob or Bob? We, uh, those are the pictures that we saw. Um, you know, as far as the pictures being morbid or so on, I, you know, that, that's a whole other uh, thing. Yeah, the x-ray, the x-ray. Yeah, oh, the x-ray, I'm sorry, I thought you were the picture. The, we saw um, x-rays that um, did not show loss of bony structure in the whole frontal area. Obviously not, because uh, that's something that is quite different from that which has been previously depicted. Yeah, this is for all of us. I try for one succinct and important question so we can get them all in, because I've been told this will end at noon sharp. Yes, very quickly. Uh, regarding uh, the autopsy of Oswald, uh, you mentioned there were fragments, Dr. Crenshaw, that were put, am I correct, on a plastic bag in front of the bag? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Yes, fragments in the autopsy of Oswald that were uh, collected and put in a bag and later lost. I don't know about any of the other 
Thanks for uh, Dr. Pritchard, um, I get the impression, and I don't, I've read your book, but I don't remember this portion, but it seems to me that you wrote this book with Shaw and didn't get to any preliminary response from your friends, the doctors, on what you were putting in there. My question is one that said, uh, did you run any of this by them prior to the time yeah, that you published uh, the book? I had no copy of the book, <clears throat> but I sent all of them a uh, copy of the uh, the manuscript, uh, the manuscript and also the cover on the outside telling them uh, when we would appear and I was asking them. I called all of them almost a month before to ask them if they would appear on television. Baxter did appear, McClellan said he'd never appear again. Uh, Perry was skiing, Shire says that he never wants to be asked anything about it again. Peter says he would and um, Ron Jones said that he would. <laughs> however, however, I never uh, asked, or we never completed this because at one time they wanted a total commitment as far as what everybody thought they thought there was going to be a big change. Since that did not occur, we went from CBS to ABC and uh, 2020. But none of them at that time indicated to you that you should not use their name Anything in the book, I assume. Oh, it was something later. Oh, they, they all know about it. So, yeah. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Crenshaw, I asked you to maybe not ask again, just so you can elaborate to the audience. The president's laying on his back on this journey, and I'm assuming that his, he's, his head is also, the back of his head is also on the journey, and his face is looking towards the ceiling. Uh, in, in observing the uh, the rear of the wound, uh, along with the other doctors uh, making the same observations. Were you literally lifting the president's head up in order to see this wound? Would it be partially obstructed if it's you know, laying in the back? I'm just to elaborate, what was it on the side? I mean, reaching over, turning his uh, front of his neck, we could look at it this way. I see. So you did kind of tilt the president's head and lift it slightly to see this rear wound. That's also the reason that we looked along the hairline. Every position and the nurse was asked about this small entrance room here in the hairline in the back. We, we moved his head up and down and looked at it, but, but not, and not the back shot. We did not turn him over or look at the head wound, yes. Okay, let's turn it over. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Dr. Weck, uh, in your presentation, which is a very fine presentation, the, uh, you mentioned uh, looking into bilateral movement. Were you going to say anything more? You used that as one of the things that needs work needs to be done. Was there any any reaction? Yeah, what I, what I, I didn't mean to be cryptic. What I was uh, suggesting is that I want to find out that from experimental animals, and I'm even in touch with veterinarians, and a couple have been in touch with me on um, the um, killing of, of, of animals in slaughterhouses. Um, some have uh, suggested seeing such a movement following the execution of the animals uh, through the performance of a high cervical spinal uh, cord, uh, you know, injury transection or, or bullet uh, fired into the uh, into the animals. And um, and then I I want to talk with uh, some neuroanatomists and neurophysiologists, uh, investigative type, you know, researchers, uh, laboratory people, to see whether they could possibly attribute such a movement to a specific mm, topographical point of injury. See, that, that's what I that's what. Dr. Crenshaw, I'm driving in. Um, I spoke with Dr. Carico on November 22nd in 91. Uh, my correct that he took a look at what we call the autopsy photographs, etc., etc., commented on them, and was in fact about that he felt that, uh, that there had been no shots fired uh, from the front at all, and all uh, injury indicated that it was from the rear. I need to know if, if you are aware, had Dr. Carico been at that time aware that you were work, working on something such as your book at this point. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm asked often that uh, I write the book after the movie JFK. Yes, I had was working on the book before that. Now, the two things that are important here about 
about this next one is one, all of the other positions have left. They did not see the women, and when the tracheostomy tube was removed, when the nurses had cleaned it up and approximated it and put it back together. I did because I was there, that was my job getting ready. The other thing at, in June the 5th in Dallas, where they say that, yeah, oh yeah, we still got this hole here, but they're pulling the scalp up and they're covering it. They're giving, I guess, the government or whoever took those photographs, um, the benefit of the doubt. But they cannot escape looking at the other one that they have not come in on, where they're holding the president up and you cannot see again the woman in the right rear portion of the head. Thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. Next question. Dr. Crenshaw and Dr. Webb, uh, thank you very much for coming. Quick point of information. Uh, you may or may not be aware of the fact that the JAM article has been reprinted already by a newsletter called Surveillant. Surveillant is published by the National Intelligence Book Center and it's a combination of book reviews and, and articles dealing with things on uh, intelligence, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, things like that. And it has extensive connections to the intelligence community. So I think it's interesting that people think that you're dangerous enough to uh, uh, distribute this to their membership. And if they weren't even charging for it, it was sent out in a regular newsletter. So I thought you would like to know that. Listen, can I get that mailing list? I'd like to send them a note saying that I have nothing to do with Dr. Crenshaw at all. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Dr. Mitchell, I'm sure that you're encountering the same thing that our family does when we plug your book. They want to know why you waited so long to tell your story. And I'm going to cheat. Dr. Grant, how do you keep your delicious sense of humor in the face of all your battles? Well, thank you. Uh, initially, before the Jam article and some of the other shopmen, uh, I, I termed it in four, four statements, uh, eternal doctrine, uh, naivety, um, some fear, and career mindset. I was a third year resident, I wanted to sleep sober, and I wanted to also stay in academic surgery, so that goes without saying. It was very evident to all the residents there uh, at Parkland that evening, even the 22nd, and definitely on the 23rd. The official uh, assassin had been caught, I mean, throughout the whole world. And all the secret service, all the people that were in, on every floor of Parkland looking around, were congratulated. This was uh, being done. The Dallas police were congratulated. They had a long left killer. And anyone that had a problem with that, everybody kept their mouth shut from the 22nd to the 29th. We spent that period, that week, trying to figure out how the president could be shot from the front, but the shooter was from the back. And then on the 29th was the first time the Secret Service there came there and said, oh yeah, by the way, there's two wounds in the back. And we almost thought that we had an egg on our face because we had not seen those wounds. I was naive too. I thought that probably, even though they took the president away, they would get the best forensic pathologist in our country. Not this bunch that's worked, that worked on him. And they would truly find, because obviously the autopsy would be best evidence. And lastly, I thought the Warren Commission would be probably the most wonderful, blue ribbon investigative group there ever was. We've seen what happens there. But most of all, the Egypt of Silent Pledge by Baxter, uh, you see what he's done now. I think I would have been run out of uh, medicine as a third year resident if I had done this in 1963. Next question. I'd like to know if we could learn anything of value if the body was assumed today in a proper autopsy performance. 
In February, June, uh, uh, yeah, what was the question? I'm sorry. Well, we find out what about X? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Could, we, could we learn anything? Is that your question? Yes. Yes. The uh, soft tissues would be, I think, uh, too much dehydrated and altered for us uh, to do a great deal with. Um, we could uh, try to do some microscopic sections of the holes, uh, but, but I don't know um, whether we would find those very productive. However, the bones of the skull would still be there, and uh, uh, that examination could be uh, very, very fruitful, and I think prob probably dispositive of the questions that remain. One, did the shot come from the rear or the uh, right front side? And two, could there have been two shots that struck the president in the head uh, in, in synchronized fashion, one from the rear and one from the grassy knoll stockade fence area? I think that's a very real consideration. I have always thought that. And the more questions that are now raised, for example, even trying to put together the jet propulsion theory, which um, uh, the other side can maybe do something with, uh, there is such a phenomenon, but then it doesn't fit with the movement of the tissue. And then when you think about the thousands of tiny pieces of metal in the brain, well, copper jackets and bullets of this kind don't fragment like that. They can break into two or even three pieces. They can suddenly become extensively deformed, but they don't leave uh, pieces like that. How come we don't see, for example, uh, all those thousands of pieces in Conley's chest under the single bullet theory or in Conley's wrist? We saw some, some fragments, some identifiable pieces um, that could be grossly perceived by the human eye but we don't see all of those things. So I think there's another strong argument for a frangible bullet, one that is designed literally to disintegrate in that fashion. So I think that if the body were to be exhumed, we could learn uh, enough to give us the answer as to whether or not there were two people shooting, and then you move on from there, as I've always said. But, uh, you know, the possibility of having this body is exhumed, exhumed I think, is among all possibilities that we might earnestly hope and pray for the most remote. Can you imagine um, in, in any kind of case where these questions remain, where a family is opposed? Think of that. I've been involved in these situations. I testified in the Mary Jo Kopechny case for the state's attorney from Massachusetts who wanted to exhume the body and uh, they, they refused to do so. It's one, one example that comes readily to mind. Uh, but just imagine the Kennedy family, the Kennedy family. You'll have the body of Jack Kennedy June uh, at the same time that I can jump off the uh, top of the Sears building and fly down to the uh, sandy shores of your lake uh, on skate. That's what that happen. Next question. Dr. White, you were just in the process of answering my question. I wonder, Dr. Crenshaw, if you would comment on, from what you saw, uh, you lean at all for that idea of two simultaneous shots. And I was wondering, Dr. Weck, whether, based on what you do know, whether you lean for that or whether you still are playing uh, kind of skeptic and saying, no, I think there was probably one final shot. You know, I I wish that I could be more definite. I, I don't. I don't. It's not my nature. It's not my my psyche to uh, to be happy and comfortable with being indefinite um, um, and, and, and uh, equivocal. And, and of course, that's why in courts of law, uh, it's, it's, you testify with reasonable medical certainty. Reasonable medical certainty. In criminal cases, a jury has to find somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but any medical or scientific expert is only asked to testify with reasonable scientific certainty. And that has been generally equated by law school professors and trial lawyers of great experience 
to me, uh, if you could quantify 51%. 51%? You could be 50.1%, but let's say 51%. That's what it means. Um, what do I believe right now? Based upon everything and so much that has come out and been studied in the past several months, things that we're doing, uh, Thomas and I, Dr. Crenshaw, more discussions with Bob Groden, uh, more discussions with other people, discussions with medical people that write to me, like two radiation oncologists from a top medical center in, in, in California, uh, and so on. The, the, more I, the more I get in, the more I, I come to believe that, that Kennedy was hit twice in the head. And those shots uh, were, were fired in synchronized fashion. I'm having a difficult time I'm having a very difficult time in explaining everything with one shot from the rear or from the right side. I'm having a very difficult time putting it all together. Uh, Dr. Weck, is it not true that there's some evidence in John Conley's body? Has he uh, agreed to uh, allow his body to be uh, autopsied when he dies? And if so, would that help? with any kind of analysis, those fragments that are still... My in knowledge, I, I'm unaware that he has made any antimortem disposition of his body, probably would be a very private nature, um, you know, living will type concept for, for other reasons. I do not know. The uh, second part of your question uh, would be answered thusly, if we could get the metal fragment out from uh, the mid-thigh along the femur, which my colleague, Mike Vaughn, now keeps moving out every other There's another thing that moves, you know, so I totally move. The, the, that fragment comes closer and closer to the skin surface, but that's okay. You're going to step into a trap because soon I'm going to say, hey, why don't you just go out there and pluck it like a, like a hair fall over this guy who's stuck it's so close to the skin. And they don't want to have it go too deep. They want to have it already, you know, it's already dying in its trajectory. They can only get so much from this bully, whatever, sweet blood from the turner. So they don't want to have it go down to the femur. But that's where that fragment is, as far as I'm concerned. That's where it always used to be. If we can get that fragment, then if that fragment can be definitively shown to be from 399, yes, then that's a very important piece of evidence. But be careful on NAA. I'd have a chance to get into that. You know, the seven elements tested for that six did not show the kind of homogeneity and and um, specific, specific to the exclusion of everything else in the world, identification with having come from 399. It is true that the one element uh, does match up uh, closely, but, but the experiments that have been done and using the different bullets from the same batch and so on, you can get closer numbers quantifiable numbers of pieces from, from different bullets in the same batch, same kind of bullet, but different, different pieces of ammunition, than you can necessarily from the fragments of the same bullet. So the Gwyn stuff is not what it's cracked up to be. It's not a matter of whether Gwyn is honest or competent. He's certainly competent. How honest he is, I don't know. I know that he sat there at the House Select Committee when Blakey uh, stated to the congressional panel that, that Dr. Gwynn had had no involvement ever in the Wire Commission Kennedy assassination, and that was a lie. Blakey knew it was a lie, and Gwynn knew it was a lie, and they both said nothing. Uh, well, Blakey told a lie, and Gwynn sat there passively and did not correct it. So I don't know, you know, how honest anybody is, um, but uh, on, on that NAA stuff, it would be important. Now, what uh, Conley did permit uh, his wounds to be looked at by uh, Dr. Bob representing the panel, but that doesn't mean a uh, damn thing. The scars, uh, uh, it's more important uh, for me to hear from Crenshaw and doctors that were there what the wounds looked like at the time, rather than how the scars healed. Next question. Dr. Mark, I just had uh, one prepared question, and I just made an observation when they were talking about the exhumation. Uh, possibility about the estimation is that uh, in the future it might be possible to do some sort of investigation that doesn't involve removal of the body. Uh, some future scientific study that would involve some type of x-rays that uh, hasn't been done now or ultrasound or some 
uh, radioactive uh, way to investigate without getting permission to exhume the body. I was thinking of the Lizzie Borden case that someone's investigating without removing the body from the uh, from the grave. Uh, just something to think about. My prepared question was, uh, Ida Dox was ordered not to include the discoloration of the brain in her drawing. And I'm wondering if you have any suspicion, as I do, that that might be evidence of some residue from the tip of an explosive bullet, depending on the type of residue. Uh, I'm sorry, the residue? Uh, the residue in the brain that Ida Dox was ordered not to include in her drawing. There was a residue in the brain, a discoloration of the brain that she was ordered not to include in the drawing. And I'm wondering if that might be residue from the explosive bullet tip. I, 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 I really am not sure um, about that. As, as Bob pointed out yesterday, and, and you know, many of us have commented on through the years, um, the business of dealing with sketches that were not made by people who were even there, the sketches are okay, but the sketches made at the instructions of others telling you uh, you know, that, that means nothing. And yet for years and years and years, this is what they would parade out, uh, these sketches. So who knows what the sketches mean? They're, 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 they're meaningless. And she was ordered not to. Yeah, yeah, when, when she, yeah, that's right. She was ordered not to put it, not to show certain things because, again, they're ghoulish nature. But with all respect to the Kennedys, Kennedys are no different than the Joneses and the Smiths and the Browns and the Blacks. I mean, what is this, this stuff about, you know, respect and respect? We're not dealing with royalty here. This is America. I'm a Democrat, and I voted for Kennedy, and I, I, I liked him, and, 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 uh, and I supported Bob Kennedy, and I supported Ted Kennedy, even after Kopechny. Uh, and, uh, you know, in a very real way, I was heavily involved. So, you know, I'm anything but anti-Kennedy, but I'll be damned. You know, just stuff about we can't show this and we can't show that. I'm not talking about showing it in the front page of the newspaper, but there are things that are part of a murder investigation that have to be done properly. And this business of guarding goes way back when only Earl Warren looked at a few pictures and nobody else looked at anything. The other members of the Warren Commission did not look at anything. Real pictures, sketches. That was some investigation. I'm going to remind you again that we probably have time for, hold on, one question, maybe two, maybe three, but at noon, uh, we're breaking. Is that correct, Mr. Doug? Okay, at noon, we're breaking. Now, the doctors, both Dr. Crenshaw and Dr. Weck, I know we'll try to get some lunch, because I know they both want to hear John Newman. We're going to hear from Jerry Pollock. Jerry? Uh, Doctor, first of all, uh, Part of what you said about when I wrote in uh, New Times that we had an association with the Warren Report, and Lakey asked him during the hearings, referred to that article and asked him if it was true, and he denied it. So uh, he did deny it under oath during the hearings. So, um, the question I wanted to ask was to, you know, regarding some, some of the ambiguity of that tobacco. We know that there were seven Secret Service and FBI agents that saw the tobacco and said it was four, four to six inches below the shoulder. That's where it was in the death certificate signed by Dr. Berkeley. The uh, autopsy doctors placed at the base of the neck. The panel report, I believe, confirmed that. Uh, Latin moved it up. The House Assassinations Committee moved it down a little bit. And the only photograph that I've seen, I guess, present being held this way, and it's kind of ambiguous, is, is uh, and I don't want to ask Dr. Crenshaw part of this also. I mean, is there anything in those photographs that would clear up where it is in a non-ambiguous way, and, and Dr. Crenshaw, if the wound was in the base of the neck, wouldn't, in the process of holding the head up, wouldn't you have seen it? Oh, yeah. That's what I think. Uh, not just myself. None of the, none of the other, uh, people, all of them were asked about the so-called entrance wound here in the airline, and no one at Parkland saw it. Thanks, question. Jerry, uh, just, it is, Talking about Dr. Crenshaw, it's a very good question, and, and, you, and you've heard the, uh, Dr. Crenshaw's answer. Uh, if it were that high up, Jerry, right? Well, they would have seen it. Um, exactly where it is, we don't have good photographs. I'll tell you what the forensic pathology panel concluded with the body in the anatomic supine position that the wound on the back was in such a location that um, the trajectory to the front of the neck was an upward angle of 11 degrees. 
an upward angle of 11 degrees. Earlier on, we mentioned something about uh, some computer analysis and color tones, but you didn't elaborate on that. What do you hope to find with that, or how would that be used as an analysis? Um, the, um, this work is very complex, and I'm not, I'm not trying to evade you. So those of you who are in the audience that are familiar with Tom Wilson stuff, it's, it's damn difficult to, um, to talk about. Uh, in, in a few seconds, but, but the, end, the quick answer to the question, what you hope to show is the location of holes in the body, the presence of totally artifactual materials uh, that prove uh, the forgery of some of the x-rays and photos. This is what, uh, what we will prove conclusively, conclusively where the holes are. And then the question of buttressing, supporting, and and corroborating what Dr. Crenshaw has stated in terms of what he saw. See, the problem we have is Dr. Crenshaw says this, and, and his colleagues said those things, as you saw in the picture on video, but then if they stand up, or they go into a governmental commission, or even Dan Rabbit, and they say, well, yeah, it would really be this, I meant this, and so, yeah, then what, are you, what are you gonna do with them? Put their hands to the fire, what are you gonna do? And we'll be talking about this 40 years from now. Okay, we have two last questions in this room. The question for Dr. White. First, an endorsement of your comments concerning the dismal performance of the major media the last 28 and a half years, uh, a great injustice. But I might add to that list, of course, the LA Times. Uh, I've seen everything they've done. As you might imagine, they didn't uh, publish any uh, portion of Dr. Crenshaw's statements. They did not review the book. And of course, uh, the JAMA article got front page treatment plus an editorial. With regard to the JAMA article, they tried to cloud the record with regard to commanding human behavior. They said the question as to who's in charge here was asked when there was a commotion outside the room, he stepped out and asked who's in charge. They say that he burned his notes because of the blood on them, which only increased the value as a good collector's item. They say he burned his notes on Saturday morning, not on Sunday after Oswald died. Your comments? Well, I'll tell you this. I was in the Air Force for two years. I worked at VA hospitals uh, for several years and uh, been in governmental offices for many years. And I have, uh, in addition to the 11, 12,000 autopsies that I've done, reviewed to 25,000 others. And many of these have been official or governmental autopsies. Let's forget the uh, civil ones done by hospital colleagues. I have never heard anything like that in my life, especially from a governmental agency. I mean, it is so patently false, this man, that he would, he, remember, he's a career military officer, and not such a, you know, huge, huge rank equivalent of a light camera, um, or a cap, I mean a recruiter, uh, that he would on his own burn the original autopsy notes of the autopsy of the president? First of all, the evidentiary value, the fact that those things may be needed in a court of law. The fact that you're doing it for a governmental agency, you're a military person, and you on your own burn those notes, no way in the world. Here's a question to ask him. How many other notes from how many other autopsies did you ever burn in the fireplace of your home? <laughs> Anybody ever ask him that question? Uh, Last question. Okay. Uh, Quick comment and question. Uh, Butler agreed to point in the article about how his qualifications are the same as Hume's, and my feeling is that he's responding to what he feels is a personal attack when Hume's qualifications are being attacked. Uh, the question is, uh, this is where we see uh, the image on the side of the head. Uh, what, uh, I, I know there's a point in the back of it, there's a lot of evidence of that. What are we seeing in this recruiter from along the side? Bob, the, the question, what, I thought Bob dealt with this yesterday uh, in great detail. What are you seeing on the Zapruder film when Kennedy is struck in the head and you see a, a, a light colored, flat white structure uh, in what I would refer to as the uh, temporal parietal area of the skull? That, that's the gentleman's question. Okay. Yeah. Do it from up here? In the Zapruder film, 
which you'll see, by the way, after, after the next, this section is over, uh, there is a flap up here near the top of the head that hinges and comes downward. It is apparent in the autopsy photographs. You do get to see it. Uh, in some of the photographs, it's open and some it's closed. Uh, the point of impact, there was massive fracturing to the head, and this part just pivoted downward and open. It is wet from gray material and blood on the inside of the head, and it reflects sunlight directly into the camera. When it was closed, and uh, Dr. Crenshaw, I asked you about this the first time we met, well over a year ago, uh, it, it, the fracturing was there, but when it closed, it just looked like fracturing. When it was opened, it appeared to be a break. Had it broken off, not been attached to the inner aspect of the scalp, it would have been gone along with the other fragments. So that's what we're seeing. It appears to be damaged in the temporal area here because it's so low, but in fact, the fault or the hole is above it. I, uh, one last statement. George, I mean, uh, if Doug Carlson asked me to do this, and if I would do it, he's going to take away my plane ticket. <laughs> um, Robert Henry, in 60 seconds, he talked about hard forensic sanitary. By the way, I have the autopsy report. My 1973 legal medicine annual, they talking about Gucci's autopsy of Robert Kennedy and JFK autopsy. In these book pages, it doesn't make any difference, in these book pages, it's 60 pages for Robert Kennedy and 6 pages for George Kennedy. Not that size alone tells you everything, but 60 to 6. You want to see what an autopsy report is like and can and should be, then look at the autopsy report of Robert Kennedy. But I want to tell you this, hard forensic scientific evidence. Kennedy's three shots, Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy shots, were all fired from a distance of one to one and a half inches. The fatal one in the right mastoid area. Now here's a case in which nobody disputes that. Nobody, including Pierre Fink and two other military pathologists whom I recommended Tom invite out to be there, which he did, and they were present at the autopsy. And then those of us who reviewed the case later on, as well as all the people in Tom's office. Nobody. No testimony has ever been given, no testimony has ever been given, grand jury, trial, or anywhere, that brings Sirhan Sirhan closer than one and a half feet. Most people talk about three feet, or one, but nobody ever brings him closer than one and a half feet. There's hard, conclusive, unchallenged, unchallenged evidence that the muzzle of the gun that killed Bobby Kennedy was held one to one and a half inches from his right mastoid area, and you can't get that case open, and you can't get the file released from the LAPD, and so on. I, this, for those of you who are already paranoid, those of you who are frustrated and wonder about you know, what, what, what goes on and so on, uh, you, 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 this is enough to just, you know, just make you go crazy or, or, or whatever, or just stay in there and keep fighting. But I just wanted to mention that. The three shots that hit him unequivocally, and there's no question about it, and they all move from back to front, from right to left, and from down up. All moved upward and all moved from back to front. Now, when was Sirhan behind Robert Kennedy, behind him, shooting toward the front? And when was the muzzle of his gun one inch from Robert Kennedy's head and shoulder? Before we express our deepest appreciation to Dr. Crenshaw and Wack, I want to tell you that uh, Dr. Carlson needs a few moments of your time, so please stay seated. And because uh, uh, Bob Grote needs to retrieve his film, he'll run that film prior to uh, John Newman's presentation. So um, if you're going to try to catch some lunch, do try to catch it and get back in time to see the, the Grote film and certainly to hear uh, Lex tell them what we think of him.
section of my own book, kind of close circle of relationships between uh, people and the uh, heroin trade, the uh, quartermaster course scandal, the man who ran that operation with the quartermaster, Senator Chaka County, in 68, the exposure of that relationship, money, a half million dollars to one million dollars, documented, sent from that operation into Creek. Alexander Hayes, CID investigation of, of, of uh, Nixon, verifying that relationship, and calling Frank Buzzard to release the smoking tape. The man who ran that operation uh, with the quartermaster corps and with the possible connivance of U.S. intelligence in Vietnam, giving nearly free heroin away to our troops, was a man named Santo Tropicante. The man who sent the money to creep the uh, drug money across overseas was Santo Tropicante. I was extremely pleased that, and therefore when I began hearing about uh, a major book that would in fact explore what I feel is the catalytic agent of the assassination of John F. Kennedy and very possibly Robert Kennedy. We're going to be hearing from John M. Newman, BA Chinese Studies, MA East Asian Studies, PhD, Modern Far Eastern History, Death, a dissertation on Vietnam during the Kennedy administration, who has taught history and government and politics for uh, the University of Maryland. He's on the faculty of the University of Maryland, University College, for the last 10 years, publishing extensively on uh, Soviet, Chinese, and Asian history. Uh, in the United States Army, a major, the branch military intelligence, 18 and a half years of service, China, Japan, the Philippines, and Thailand assignments. Recently, most recently, I think you know, uh, he has, uh, had published JFK and Vietnam. He was an advisor to Oliver Stone on the part of uh, the Sutherland Park Major X, that would be uh, that composite of uh, Fletcher Prouty and uh, John Newman. He wrote several of the um, Pentagon and White House scenes for the movie Oliver Stone. It's my great pleasure to introduce John M. Newman. Now, 
I would like to uh, throw out a little bit of a challenge to the assassination research community um, in, in that I don't think with respect to this subject, for example, Vietnam and what possible relationship it could have to the assassination, or policy in general, that we're asking the right questions. I do not really get into them in my work, and I am constantly amazed when I attend these functions that I'm not asked what I think would be uh, the right sort of questions about the implications of this work. Um, so I'm going to go beyond the, the safety of the sandbox in which I normally play today and, and try and ask a few of those questions myself before I get started. And then if you would, sort of make a mental note of them as I go through the material. And uh, we can talk about that uh, afterward. But I would start by just make, asking two questions that are extremely important. First of all, from a, if one would make the case that there were any linkage at all between policy considerations of the assassination of John Kennedy, um, we would have to know whether from a policy standpoint, it would make any difference if Kennedy had been assassinated. Phrase the question that way. Uh, and number two, what if, therefore, uh, what if any of Kennedy's policies were reversed by Johnson? Um, now, I want to say something about that uh, as a sort of a composite module on its own before dealing with Kennedy and Vietnam as a larger subject because uh, of what's happened here after all of some movie. We have been treated to a, what I think is a false history uh, on this issue anyway for many years, but particularly now, at this, at this moment, we're being treated to an amazing uh, array uh, of commentary from pundits in the media and even so-called historians. And it's a direct result of this movie. In fact, why don't I just put up oh, I don't want to do that. I wanted to, to do that there. Um, this is good. <laughs> you can't read it. What, what does it say? Well, it's actually, that's Oliver jumping onto the back of the, uh, the limousine and the fellows next to the driver wearing a CIA uh, sweater. They're saying, gun it. The stone's trying to open the Trump. That actually, you see, uh, that's really what I think is going on here now, because when Bob Novak slams his fist down and declares that uh, this whole idea of Kennedy getting out of Vietnam is a bunch of bunk, and after all, what does Bob Novak know about <laughs> Kennedy in Vietnam? But the, the vigor, the, the feeling, the intensity of that act, did y'all see that on, on uh, Crossfire? It was amazing, the, the demonstration of emotion. Uh, and George Will. But they're not the only ones. We have, for example, Stanley Carnow, whose book I've used many times as a text, one of many texts, in teaching the Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam and History is the name, who comes out now to tell us that uh, the withdrawal plan was a gimmick. Now he doesn't say that in his book, but he says it after Oliver Stone's movie is taken as a central thesis uh, that Kennedy would have withdrawn from Vietnam. He's also telling us that, you know, also, one day uh, I was uh, down on the set in New Orleans and um, went up to Oliver and I said, Oliver, would you take a look at this? And I showed him a couple of lines out of Carnot's book. And uh, those lines were uh, attributed to Johnson on December 24, 1963, just a couple of weeks after the assassination. And Johnson, uh, according to Carnot, says just to the Joint Chiefs, by the way, he's talking to, uh, to which one, I don't know, or to how many, I don't know. Just let me get elected and you can have your war. And I said, Oliver, would you like to put this in the movie? And he looked at it and he, and he looked at it and he thought and thought and then he smiled from ear to ear and he said, good work. 
and they went to the movie and went. Yeah. Well, now uh, Stanley Carnot is very angry about that. In fact, he wrote an article uh, uh, for George, or input it into another George Wagner article, and, and he said, well, that's not what I said at all in my book. When I, I put that in there, I explained the real context. I said that these, uh, that in making that statement, uh, Lyndon Johnson was probably uh, making, uh, swaging the brass with promises he may never have intended to keep. Well, the, that's an interesting comment. I think it really tells us a lot about Stanley Carnell and how he's coming at this whole package. And it really made me go back and start to reread Stanley Carnell. Um, you see, the fact is that Johnson and uh, John Kennedy, as I will demonstrate here this afternoon, held very different views on the war. And that's no secret. Even George Bundy told me that, finally, in an interview. And not only that, not only did he hold a different, and did Johnson hold different and stronger views on the war, but the fact is that after, so that's before the promise, okay? Before the promise, what's the pattern? He has stronger views on the war. Well, what about after the promise? He kept it. Okay, he kept it. So, I say the record uh, of Lyndon Baines Johnson, before and after he made that comment, that dark comment that one night a few uh, days after the assassination, uh, that he in fact he might have been making a promise he very well intended to keep. So it's not at all ludicrous uh, for Oliver Stone to seize on that and put it in his movie, much as Carnot uh, doesn't like it. William Gibbons, a uh, historian at Princeton U University, argues that uh, the withdrawal plan was a uh, device, something to uh, convince Yim, who was very proud, uh, that he should reform. And the, the idea here is that uh, we're going to scare Yim into reforming by threatening uh, to withdraw a thousand American soldiers. The problem with that is that, uh, in fact, that reasoning I was able to discover somewhere in a document, but the person who advocated this line of thought was Maxwell Taylor, General Maxwell Taylor, not John Kennedy. And I'll show you a document on that subject later, which is very interesting. I guess the point is that we have academics coming out of the closet now with august reputations at Princeton or like Carnell talking about the withdrawal plan as a gimmick or a device. Uh, and, and we have media pundits saying it's absolutely ludicrous, there's no evidence for it. And, and the, the fact is that, well, I won't accuse them of making it up, they're, they're just totally ignorant. They're just totally ignorant. Now, take for example, Harry Summers takes a different attack. Harry Summers and I have a lot of love for uh, over this whole question. Uh, and I won't go into, into uh, our particular arguments, but Harry Summers has been attacking Oliver Stone on this very issue, Kennedy and the withdrawal plan and, and so on. But Summers does not uh, dismiss uh, out of hand that this idea of the Kennedy withdrawal plan. He just says that, yeah, there are people who, uh, who say Kennedy had such a plan, but they're just friends of Kennedy and conspiracy theorists. And uh, they're just trying to remake Kennedy politically for the 1990s. And I wanted to talk to you about some of those conspiracy theorists. Uh, the first one being Senator Mansfield, who was the, uh, of course, the House uh, excuse, Senate Majority Leader. And another one, uh, Tip O'Neill, the uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, they're, actually, the comments he made to Mansfield are rather famous. And I won't go on. Um, if you've read Kenny McDonald's book or you've read some of the media coverage, you know about them already. Um, Tip O'Neill came in rather late in the game uh, just a few years ago. His book, Man of the House, and talked about Kennedy told him too that he was withdrawing from Vietnam and had a definite plan. And in fact, that he and Tip O'Neill together were laying out a series of debates with Goldwater during the coming campaign where Kennedy would take the anti-war stance and Goldwater was going to take the pro-war stance. And, and he talked about that recently, Tip O'Neill did on the uh, Larry King Live show. Uh, so Tip O'Neill now uh, adds his uh, name to the list of conspiracy theorists. In addition to uh, this, the House uh, Speaker and the Senate uh, Majority Leader, we have 
Uh, in fact, let me say, the only person who really misses the significance, by the way, is Secretary of State Rusk, who claims to this day uh, that he never knew about the withdrawal plan. Kennedy never told him. So it's crazy. If there, if, if there was, then Kennedy must have uh, been playing politics, and Kennedy would never do that. But at State Department, well, who we have is, is uh, Roger Hillsman, who happened to be not just another guy over there, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Far Eastern Affairs. And he discussed Kennedy's withdrawal plan with, uh, with Kennedy and, and tells us about it. Um, and he's been writing about it recently in the New York Times as well. Uh, but he talked about it years ago. He didn't just do it because Oliver Stone made a movie. Uh, in the National Security Council, uh, we have the top Vietnam guy. There is named Michael Forrestal. And he also tells us that Kennedy had a withdrawal plan, discussed it with him in, in the days before his death. Um, if we move over to the Pentagon, for example, we have the Secretary of Defense, uh, who has also acknowledged this uh, withdrawal plan as a real one, although McNamara says he doesn't know what Kennedy would or would not have done after uh, had he lived, because things uh, might have changed. Yeah, he might have changed. Nonetheless, it's not some kooky idea, according to McNamara. McNamara acknowledges its existence. Uh, then we can go one rung down to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's Maxwell Taylor. And uh, he tells us uh, that, indeed, uh, the only person against intervention was John Kennedy. That every time that he, Taylor, and the, and the generals uh, uh, went to Kennedy and asked for combat troops, Kennedy would say, now, well, uh, you guys just go and and get General MacArthur to agree with that, and I'll agree with that. General MacArthur had direct hands-on experience uh, with sending American combat troops to, to Asia. And what happens uh, when you get uh, too close to China? And he was of the opinion that we should never do that again, and told Kennedy uh, repeatedly so. General Galvin uh, was, a, for a while, looked like he was going to uh, rise all the way to the top. A uh, very famous army general, a very, uh, and he was a friend of Kennedy, but he was also an army general who talked to Kennedy about his military plans for 15 years. Uh, and says on many occasions, uh, Kennedy uh, said he would never send uh, combat troops there. And General Palmer, uh, who was the assistant to the deputy chief of staff for, for operations in the Pentagon, is another and during the crucial months. Uh, Kennedy's withdrawal plan uh, also has acknowledged it, it and Kennedy's uh, firm uh, stance against sending combat troops. So we have, I would submit, a number of august conspiracy theorists and, uh, and friends here uh, that talk about A, Kennedy's complete unwillingness to send combat troops, and B, uh, his uh, withdrawal plan. I think it's high time that we put the shoe on the right foot. Why should, with the record as it is, and I'll show you a great deal today, do we need to argue, put, frame the argument as it were, have to prove that Kennedy was pulling out of Vietnam? We shouldn't have to do that. I will go along with anyone who says, Maybe Kennedy would have changed his mind. I don't agree with that. I don't think he would. But if you want to frame the argument that way, I'm willing to sit down and talk with you. The fact is that Johnson did change Kennedy's policy. Kennedy might have changed his policy too. But from here on out, I'm only interested in framing the argument that way. If we want to talk what if, what if, what if, what would Kennedy might have done had he lived? Would he have continued his policy, or would he have changed his policy? That is the way the question needs to be framed. And uh, it's not being framed that way. We're being told that we're complete, we're lunatic for even considering that there is a withdrawal plan. We're kooks. We're not uh, good Americans. And it's a direct reaction to this to this film. Um, I want to get that. I just had to get that out of my system early. Uh, the, the, the fact that we can answer these questions in the affirmative, i.e., yes, it made a difference uh, from a policy standpoint whether or not John Kennedy lived or died, 
And yes, indeed, Johnson uh, reversed his, his policy in Vietnam, probably in Indonesia and other places. Peter Dale Scott's done some excellent work on Indonesia being followed up. That's only preliminary. But I think you're going to find a general pattern. Um, Indonesia and, uh, and some Latin American countries are also uh, good candidates uh, for, for the research here. But yes, it is, a, it is true that Johnson reversed uh, Kennedy's policy. These questions, even though we answer the affirmative, don't get us into a link, any link uh, necessarily between these reversals and, and, the, and the assassination of the president. There are other questions that we must ask if we are to establish such a link. And again, it has not been the subject of my work, but I wish the, the community would go this direction. So let me ask a couple. Okay? <clears throat> let me just say this before I, you know what we're talking about, if this if this is true, um, is it's a secret thing we can't really see or touch. Uh, obviously, you're not going to see a document, hey, let's kill Kennedy and, and reverse his policies, any more than you're going to see a, a document, you know, let's shoot the president, uh, we're trying to get a crossfire, or whatever. It's not a, 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 an unencrypted document, so to speak, for us to, to, to look at. Um, from our point of view, then, if, if one were to search for this, what you would be looking for uh, is the external characteristics, you see, uh, of it. And uh, one would have to, uh, as an analyst, analyze uh, the external characteristics of this linkage uh, between policy and mechanics. Now, first of all, are there any anomalies in the policy area uh, which indicate the president's desires or even his express orders were being violated? Are there any indicators of attempts or efforts to circumvent the policy process? And if so, did this circumvention work in a direction to constrain presidential choices? If these anomalies exist, is there a pattern to them? Does this pattern match other patterns sequentially, for example, with Oswald claiming? Do we notice time horizons and these anomalous uh, activities in the policy arena matching in any way uh, anomalies in other areas? As an analyst, or as analysts, these are the sorts of things, patterns we should be searching for. Does the same name keep popping up with respect to these uh, anomalous areas? And here's another one, and it's, I'm surprised that it really hasn't been, this question hasn't been asked in a major way. Okay. Is there any evidence of an effort to cover up the policy reversal after the fact? And there are more questions. Those are just some quick ones that come to mind, and they really should be asked, and we should take a look at the works of, of many of you who are here today uh, and not just my work, but uh, and look at them as compartments and, and look for these cross-fertilizations as analysts and quit arguing so much about little things. You know, I've seen a lot of that going on, believe me. <laughs> Finally, there, there's one, uh, one thing I want to throw out before I get started, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to do this just as a theoretical exercise only. This is probably not true at all, and I'm sure it's not, but I'll just throw it out as a paradigm, uh, as a maybe, as a what if. What if a JFK made things very easy, and I, this is a what if in the area of a linkage between uh, Vietnam and the assassination. It's totally a what if. What if JFK made things very easy for his opponents by his own public duplicity? i.e. his public stance against withdrawing, and I'll talk about that more later. But, on the other hand, made things very, very difficult at the top secret level by leaving a last will and testament of withdrawal. And what if, therefore, 
an attempt is made to construct a new last will and testament. Not too soon, because Kennedy would see it and would not approve it, but not too late, because it would be a last will and testament of his. It would look like policy reversal. But to construct a new one just at the right time, just before the assassination, in order to leave the impression that JFK was in the process of reversing himself. I just throw that out as a totally theoretical paradigm. And you can, uh, as I go through the material today, you can wonder about whether or not anything, uh, any of the evidence in the documents shed any light on that theoretical proposition. Now, uh, I am going to compartmentalize my remarks now into three areas. Chronologically, 61, 62, and 63. It just about works that way. Uh, and <clears throat> I want to start with 61. We'll start at the beginning. And let me just tell you, for my doctoral dissertation, I called out 61 and spent my entire 400 pages just on 1961. And there was a reason for that. 1961 is a relatively clean year in the sense that people don't tell lies in the policy structure. It's a, uh, there is a struggle, but the lines of the struggle are clearly drawn, and we understand basically what everybody wants to do. They, they write memoranda, they explain what they want to happen, and they say what? That struggle is over at the end of 1961. The president wins, and a lot of other people lose, and then the, the game changes. The floor falls away, and it's smoke and mirrors for the next two years. So 1961 uh, is, a, is an interesting year. It's a good baseline. And it begins uh, right away uh, for us with uh, an airlift in Laos, a Soviet airlift. This airlift uh, of Russian military hardware and North Vietnamese cadres into the, the Laos and Panhandle is initiated after Kennedy's election, but before his inauguration, particularly vulnerable time from Washington's standpoint. And uh, Eisenhower tells John Kennedy that uh, he, he, Eisenhower, uh, would intervene with American combat forces, and he advised Kennedy to do so. But uh, that he, Eisenhower, had not made that decision uh, because he wished to leave it proper so to to become the president. The very first thing Kennedy faces uh, is the, uh, this decision on whether or not to intervene in Southeast Asia with combat troops. Um, it's also funny that the, the, uh, the first time he was briefed on Vietnam, uh, in the same meeting, he was briefed on the uh, Cuban invasion plan. So there, it, it, it's uh, a wake up call for the incoming president, right in the first few days of office, of being, being asked to uh, uh, intervene, Cuba intervene in Laos, and uh, I don't know what anywhere else, but that's, those are rather startling decisions uh, to be facing right from the get-go. Now, he doesn't want to intervene in Laos. He wants to, to uh, pursue a diplomatic solution. But he is uh, pressured into going along with a plan that says, well, look, we really need to get a militarily advantageous position first. Then we can negotiate from a position of strength. And then we can have uh, a diplomatic solution uh, to the crisis. So he buys this. He buys this and he approves the plan. And he's told it'll work because uh, um, the pro-American Forces of General Fumi will, will win on the ground, and uh, so on, so on, so on. This is based on an intelligence estimate, uh, which in turn is based upon military intelligence reporting from Laos. And anyway, he approves it, and uh, it falls flat on its face, and it turns out the intelligence estimate was wrong. And even during the process of this estimate, what had happened is there were people who had information uh, that showed this plan was going to fall apart. 
but because some Air Force guy didn't have this clearance or that clearance, uh, they were not allowed to discuss it in the room, and the estimate went forward, and the Joint Chiefs made the recommendation, the President bought off, and all these people died in Laos, and the American system collapsed. And this happened in March of 1961. And uh, so you've heard stories about the animosities and the bad intelligence in the Bay of Pigs, but I bring this out, uh, or give this as an example, right off the, the get-go, of what Kennedy was facing and what he, what he felt he was facing was extremely uh, well, awful uh, advice, uh, both from, from the military and from the intelligence community on Southeast Asia. Um, in any event, the Ralph's thing boiled on for a few weeks. Uh, Kennedy came very close to an intervening. Very close. And I don't know that he wouldn't have. And if there's nothing in my book or nothing I'm going to say here today uh, which should be construed as saying Kennedy was a pacifist. He was no pacifist. He was willing to use American power, American military power, even nuclear weapons in certain scenarios. But there were significant differences of opinion uh, over when, how, where, and to what extent we should go. We'll talk about those today. But certainly not in, in, in Laos um, in the end. But it became very close. So close, in fact, that what happened in Desert Shield uh, happened, in, the precise moves were made back in 1961. The, the entire uh, American military force that was in the Pacific Theater was assembled, brought, steamed up into the Gulf of uh, Siam, command ready in Okinawa. General Harkins was the uh, commander of the invasion. American invasion force for Laos. And the date was set for the final presidential decision, uh, April 27th. And uh, on the 20th of April, just one week before that, uh, the, the Cuban operation was a paper failure. Now, that, the failure of that operation doomed the Laos invasion plan. And Kennedy would say later, he would wave, wave in sheets of cables, my God, if I had uh, uh, taken these seriously, we'd be in Laos by now. Because uh, he was deadly serious about going into Laos. And the thing that stopped him uh, was this, this pattern culminating in Cuba, not starting in Cuba. As I mentioned, it goes back into the Laos planning itself, culminating in the failed Cuban operation. And what we, need, what we have then here is the, the new administration is not even a few weeks old, a couple of months old, and we have the president alienated from his top military and intelligence advisor. What happens as a result of the decision not to, and in fact, the decision is not rendered on the 27th. And actually, the decision is never rendered. It just kind of goes away. And everyone realizes by early May that we are not going to go in. But the, the perception in the joint, amongst the Joint Chiefs is that day uh, when there is an argument, a tremendous argument over uh, going into Laos. That evening, uh, the perception of the Pentagon is that we will not go into Laos. And cables are sent out to the Pacific Theater saying as much. And that same night, that very same night, 27 April 1961, within hours of the perception in the Pentagon that we were not going to, to use those assembled forces to go into Laos, a new annex for something called the Vietnam Task Force Report was drafted. And up to that point, the Vietnam Task Force Report calling for increased American aid in Vietnam and, and several other measures, uh, had no provision for what was put into this annex, and that was a, an American troop commitment to Vietnam. So the very first sentence in a document about using American troops in Vietnam was written within hours after the perception hit home in the Pentagon that we would not invade Laos. And it's interesting, uh, there were several drafts of this annex. Draft uh, one didn't have his troop committed, the second draft did, and it stayed in the third draft. The fellow who authored this 
name is Edward Lancelot. That's interesting. <coughs> now, to make to to speed up the story here, uh, we give up the ghost on uh, on any idea of uh, intervening in Laos within the next week. Um, Kennedy does not buy into invading Vietnam in April of 1961. And really the rest of the year, uh, what we see here, Kennedy, and there's another segment here, and I'm going to return to it later, and to, to go out and sort of clean up the mess, there's a tremendous loss of confidence uh, in, in U.S. support amongst the re uh, regimes uh, that were our allies in East Asia as a result of his decision not to, to use American forces. And Johnson was sent out. Uh, to sort of beef up morale, okay? and that's a chapter I want to return to later because Johnson does some things he shouldn't do uh, while he's out there. But that and this whole process of uh, these, these recommendations, uh, and which included using nuclear weapons, by the way, are absolutely incredible. If you read the uh, the planning meetings that were held, there was an expectation amongst several of the planners. Uh, some generals, some civilians, that we would use nuclear weapons in this uh, uh, movement to Laos. In any event, that whole sequence so soured Kennedy on his own advisors with respect to Southeast Asia policy that he turned over the baton, so to speak, to Maxwell Taylor, whom he had brought in um, from retirement to investigate the failed Bay of Pigs affair in April. And it, it, by June, uh, in effect, Taylor runs American policy in Southeast Asia with some input from Ross Dow on the NSC, U. Alexis Johnson over in state. But, but Taylor, the magic word, if you send a document to Kennedy uh, from June forward, you got to say, I, you know, I, 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 can, I clear it to Taylor, or Taylor agrees, or uh, it's clear that Taylor is, is run uh, the show. And uh, in the end, Taylor, too, joins forces with those urging Kennedy to send American combat troops in Vietnam. That would be November 1961. The story of Vietnam, Kennedy in Vietnam, during those six months, from June all the way up to the end of 61, really has a couple of components to it. In Vietnam itself is the continuing success of the Viet Cong. Uh, they're growing in numbers, and uh, the area under their control is expanding. And as that thing is escalating, so is the argument in Washington over what to do about it, and principally the argument over between Kennedy uh, and, and his advisors over whether or not to send American combat forces. He has urged a few more times to, do, to send it to Laos, but basically the argument is Vietnam. The proposals are numerous and they increase in number. By the time we get to November 1963, uh, 1961, there are probably 20 or 30 different proposals that are sent to John Kennedy asking him to approve the, of the introduction of American combat troops to Vietnam. And in the end, he uh, does not do that. I'm going to tell you uh, about that decision. NSAM 111. NSAM, by the way, is an acronym for Presidential Directive, National Security Action Memorandum, what it stands for. NSAM 111, which was uh, his last no to that, I'm going to discuss it, uh, was in November of 1961. But I want to uh, summarize all those proposals and their significance in this way. And also to, to talk to you about it in terms of the debate right now that's going on in the newspapers and the periodicals. The, and I don't care about the, the Novaks and, and the George Wills and these, and these uh, uh, sages of Saigon. Uh, the people that concern me are really the so-called critical academics who uh, tell us that, well, we don't really know what Kennedy would have done or wouldn't have done at all uh, had he lived. 
because he never really faced the situation that Lyndon Johnson faced. So no matter what you say or don't say, uh, just the fact that the, the situation was different and the arguments were different prevent us from knowing. And, and I say both. And that's why it's so important to look at the record of 1961 and to look at these proposals and what was in them. What were the arguments that were made to Kennedy? Why should we do this thing? What was he told was at stake? What if he didn't do it? Well, he was told that the fate of South Vietnam hung in the balance. It was critical. They were going to lose. He was told, and, and that, of course, that's not reason in itself enough. If you want to convince a president of this, you've got to tell him that critical U.S. interests are involved. And they did, both in the East Asian region and globally. Critical U.S. interests were at stake. In some of these memorandums, he was threatened with the loss of India, Japan, Australia. The whole structure of the free world was going to come crumbling down if he did not send America, several American combat divisions to Vietnam. Those were the arguments that were placed before the president in November of 1961. Now, can anyone think of a stronger argument? I won't hold my breath because I can't think of, of how much stronger the case could be made. And incidentally, those were the same arguments put to Lyndon Johnson by the same advisors in 1964-1965. Kennedy said no, and Johnson said yes, and it's that simple. If anything, it would have been far easier to say yes in 1961 when the Viet Cong were fewer. Now, not only did he say no in the end, uh, but what he did agree to, by the way, was to deepen our military involvement significantly. The advisors would grow from 880 to about 16,000 by the end of 1963. We would send uh, under uh, Operation Beef Up armored personnel carriers, herbicidal aircraft, bombing aircraft, lots of weapons. So, military advisors and materiel would be significantly increased. But the answer was no on American ground combat divisions. And when he issued this NSAM 111, he called a meeting in the White House and you can read about it. The documents were released uh, uh, just recently, a couple of years ago. He called the meeting and he and basically uh, read his advisors right up and, and explained that he, they had two choices. One was to support his policy, the other one was to get out. And get out were the words he used. And uh, this happened right after he fired several people. Uh, he had been waiting to fire Dulles. Uh, that was going to happen anyway, most people knew, but he waited until uh, right at this time. Dulles was fired, right? At the time, uh, NSAM 111 is issued, and there's uh, something at the State Department called the Thanksgiving Day Massacre, where lots of people are fired. And uh, then he issues uh, NSAM 111, calls these people in, and says, You can get with my policy, or you can get out. And not only that, he said, I want a man, I want one man personally responsible for implementing my policy. And he, the people were told this before they attended the meeting. So at the meeting, McNamara said, I'm a Secretary of Defense McNamara said, I did. No one ever again asked John Kennedy for combat troops in Southeast Asia. That was the end of the struggle. November 22nd, 1961. 